Okay, so in this lecture, I basically want to discuss very few uh, interesting ideas about how to handle how to handle failures of disks and also how to improve the efficiency performance of IO when we have the uh, secondary storage. So, we have seen so far our discussions have not focused on this aspect. We have used a single disk and then we also you know notice that with a single disk sometimes the, the block access involves block access involves um, seek time rotational delay and all that so it might take some something like 6 6 milliseconds to a, a, a few uh, uh, tens of milliseconds sometimes so that, that that's a substantial amount of time and so one of the one of the ideas that come up to us when when we when we look at this situation is obviously why don't we do some kind of a parallel data access? Okay. Why don't we put lots of disks together and then why don't we access them simultaneously? Because we can, if the bus is speed, uh, bus is fast enough and uh, we may be able to, you know, read off uh, and we can make a white bus and then we can read off several disks simultaneously and then gain speed of, uh, you know, of access. So, in this context, there is a very interesting term called RAID. It's it it is uh, it is called uh, as redundant arrays of independent disks. Okay. Earlier it used to be uh, uh, you know expanded as redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. Okay. Whether it is inexpensive or not, you now we were going to treat these disks as independent and then put an array you know array of these disks and then see how we can actually benefit from uh, this thing. So, we will this is a RAID is a umbrella term. So, it has a bunch of techniques bunch of ideas uh, using which we can improve performance as well as reliability of the storage. So, we will briefly discuss the main ideas behind uh, all um, this RAID uh, in, the, in the in this lecture. Okay. So, essentially Two uh, main ideas are kind of employed in this uh, situation. One is called data striping. That means distribute the data onto the onto multiple disks. Okay, so one disk data is actually uh, is is stored onto multiple disks. I will we'll talk about exactly how we can do that. Um, so. The idea is, of course, if, is that if you read those disks parallelly, then you will get access to your data, faster access to data. And then, since this can, disks can fail, disks can fail, add some redundant information, redundant data, so that we can recover from the disk crashes. This is the second idea. So, in fact, we will be taking help from error recovery uh, codes in this uh, in this context. So, let us see how the details are. So, let us first consider this idea of called data striping. Right? Basically, we want to distribute data onto multiple disks. So, you could you could do one thing what is called bit level striping, which is a very you know uh, lowest granularity you can think about. So, take the ith bit of each byte and store it in the ith disk. Bit, we are talking about a bit of data. Okay. A ith bit of each each disk block has 4096 or something like that, uh, you know, bytes and each byte has 8 bits. So, we are talking about uh, suppose suppose there are eight byte uh, we have eight bits per byte and so let's say we employ eight disks uh, parallelly we employ eight disks parallelly so for each byte we store the zeroth bit in the zeroth disk first bit in this uh, in the first disk and so on so we distribute all these bits across all the 
eight disks. Now, of course, you can transfer data from the disk at only block by block. So, suppose you now issue a parallel block read for all these eight disks. So, you will end up having eight eight blocks of data. Actually, you can see that eight fold increase in the data speed. You get the point. See, if you yeah take a block, take a block of data, and then you know take only the uh, one bit of it, right? One bit goes to one disk. One bit goes to one disk. So you're operating uh, eight. Uh, so eight blocks, eight blocks will be covered in the in the first blocks of all these disks. So if you read a give a disk read, which is a parallel disk read. Because each of these things are independent, you will end up getting 8 blocks of data, 8 blocks of data. So, of course, you have to assemble all the bytes. From each of them, you will get uh, 1 bit from each disk and then you keep on assembling all the bytes. So, you will get 8 fold increase in this, in the speed of the. The one, of course, downside of this whole thing is that if you have to read or write a, a block, then all the 8 disks are involved because the, the data is striped across all the disks. So, it involves users of all the, the disk. As against this, there is another idea called block level striping. Instead of doing a very minute level uh, bit level um, striping, of course, even higher, slightly higher granularity is also possible. You can you can decide. Okay, I'll I will take every four bits uh, of each byte and then uh, and then do it, take that as a unit and then stripe across. A block level striping. What it does is to do this. The eighth block of the data is on the eighth disk. Uh, sorry, eighth disk. Eighth block of the data is on the eighth disk. So you have a bunch of disks. So let's say you have some n number of disks. Then uh, there are two two things, uh, two advantages we get out of this block level striping. First thing is you can actually uh, you know, handle n simultaneous block requests because the uh, the data, you know, if it is uh, if it is like uh, it is likely to be there on different disks, and so you can actually probably be able to handle some simultaneous number of uh, disk reads because all of them are independent. Okay, that is one thing. Then, supposing uh, you got a big data request, which is a multi-block kind of request. Then you can you can do a uh, parallel read, and then you can get n fold increase in the in the transfer rate. Just like in uh, bit level striping, you'll also in here also you'll get uh, n fold uh, increase in uh, transfer rate. Okay. Now these are trying to use multiple disks and then do parallel reads, and then we it is not very difficult to to see that. We will get uh, higher speeds uh, of reading data, but what if the di one of these disks fail? Then we have lost the whole data, right? Because uh, somewhere uh, some block of the uh, file is on some disk, and that disk failed, and so uh, you know you can't get the complete uh, file. So the reliability of this set of disks. Uh, comes down, we will see how do we model the reliability. The reliability is, is, is actually there are more details to it, but let, let us say we will just take one parameter called mean time to failure, mean time to failure. So, this is, so if you have several disks, you know how often they fail, that is the kind of thing. Each individual disk will actually have a probability of failure which is a little high in when you when you, you know start using the disk and then actually uh, usually they run for a long period like 10 years or something like that but towards the end then the, the, the probability of the failure actually uh, increases again because of the wear and tear and also the uh, tiny dust particles coming into the into the disk and things like that but normally you can uh, you can take this, uh, you know, if the disk has been after manufacturing, it has been tested so that there are no initial errors and things like that. It has 
uh, enter the stable uh, kind of uh, regime, then you can imagine that it has a uh, good time like I have just taken some figure like this. These are typical figures like, like 2 lakh, uh, 2, uh, um, uh, 200,000 uh, hours. Uh. So, one way to imagine, uh, one way to convert, uh, use this number is to think of the probability of a failure of a disk, single disk in an hour is something like 1 over uh, uh, 240,000. Now, now, if this particular disk is part of a 100 disk set, then each of these disks are independent and they can fail independently. And so, the probability of the failure of any one of the disk of the 100 disks is 100 times more than this. It is plus uh, of these things. So, that is about, so if you convert that into mean time to failure, then it is about like 3 months. And that's that is dangerous, right? You do not expect a failure to keep coming every three months. So, that is really that's a bad. So, so, the more number of disks you use, the higher is the possibility of you know disk failures. So, if you use, uh, if you decide to use uh, more number of disks uh, for parallel access in order to improve performance, we should be worried about how to improve the reliability simultaneously. Okay. So, let us see now how to improve the reliability of disks. One very simple idea is mirror the disk. For every data disk, you also maintain a, a copy of that. So, every disk, the data of the entire disk is copied onto another disk. So, each disk has a mirror disk, same data on both of them. So, if a disk fails, use the mirror of the disk till the original is replaced. That is the policy you will use. Now, you can see that even though there are you know many number of uh, disks, if each of the disk is actually mirrored like this, then the uh, even though the probability of failure of the disks is uh, uh, is high, the probability of data loss actually will decrease. I will show you how exactly that happens. Let us look at this figures. Let us say we have a uh, disk with uh, you know mean time to failure of uh, 240,000 hours and it is mirrored with the same kind of disk. Okay. So, the probability of a disk failure in a particular hour is, a, is 2 over this, is 2 over this. Why is 2? Because there are 2 disks, the data disk and its mirror. So, a probability of a single disk failure is 2 over this much. Let us say we have a time to repair uh, or you know copying, uh, procuring a new disk and then you know making a copy of the whole uh, disk onto that thing as something like 24 hours. Now, you can see that the actual data loss will occur to us when you know while we are still not ready with the disk copy or while we are copying if the disk uh, fails again. So, that is the uh, if the same disk fails for on which we, we now have a uh, suppose there is a failure we have been using the mirror. So, the probability of the data loss is the probability of one disk failing and the mirror disk failing, right. So, the uh, so the what is the probability of the mirror disk failing when we are copying is that it is you can think of it as uh, the uh, 24 times uh, 24 uh, over this this particular number because it is a probability in within 24 hours, so per hour is like that and so it is like this. So, the probability of data loss is actually this, this sequence of events happening like this. One of the disks fails and then the within the 24 hours uh, the same another uh, disk fails. So, that is something like this. So, you can put and then calculate it will give you um, this number. So, if you convert that into mean time to failure it is very high. So, okay. 
So, one can actually improve the reliability of this entire uh, you know system and then the, the probability of data loss will be very less if you use mirroring. Mirroring is a, a very nice technique uh, where we can improve the uh, reliability greatly. But then the problem with mirroring is uh, when when there are 10 disks, you are also again having 10 other redundant disks. When the data disks are there, and then redundant disks are equal number of redundant disks. Also, you are kind of using 50 percent as redundancy. That is a very high amount of uh, redundancy. Um, if you have a mirror disk, reading um, is same as you know reading a single disk or it can be even slightly better uh, you might you might actually read from any of the disks because the copies are there so you may be actually be able to handle two simultaneous uh, uh, block accesses at a time because there are two copies of the file anyway. writing can be done parallelly so, in both disks you can write. So, it it is not uh, very worse. In fact, in practice you have to probably pause a little before you uh, you know write uh, onto the mirror copy. So, it will be a little less performance wise. Okay, but the main issue here is the amount of redundant disks that you are using. So, it gives you high reliability, but then 50 percent uh, redundancy. Now, what we will do here in this context, we use the good old parity function from digital, uh, from digital logic and then you know surprisingly we will get good performance. So, we will see this. What is parity? You so, this is the idea. The idea is store additional information to record data of the failed list. So, for this additional information, all that we will be doing actually is use parity, the good old parity function. So, let us look at parity function. Parity bit is defined as 1 if the number of 1s is odd, 0 otherwise. In a, in a, in a, in a sequence of bits, in a sequence of bits, if the number of ones is odd, then the parity bit is one. If the number of ones is even, then the parity bit is zero. Okay. Now, so here is the uh, uh, some sequence of uh, bits. You can see that it's it has four ones, and so the parity is zero. So, if you now actually take the original bits and the parity bit together and then look at the number of ones in that, you can see that it will be always even. That is how it is defined right parity. So, here is another example. If, so, you can see one one. So, there are five ones and, and so the parity bit is one and so the overall number of ones will always be even. That is how the parity function works. So, basically we can now make use of this and then you know uh, create what is called a parity block. For a block, for a bunch of blocks, for a bunch of blocks, let us assume the block, block level data striping has occurred, block level data striping has occurred. That means, blocks are stored across some five disks or something like that okay in a modulo five function like that no so some blocks are existing on these five disks now take the sixth disk take the sixth disk on each of these first blocks of all these five disks construct a bit level parity at the bit level construct a parity Consider the ith bit, ith bits of all the blocks 
on all these disks, compute its parity and make that as the ith bit of the parity block. Parity block. Okay. So you consider say block block 0 of all the disks. So in the block 0 of all the disks, take the ith bit and compute the parity. Take the parity bit and make that as the ith bit of the parity disk, parity block. Okay. So do you get the idea of how to construct parity blocks? So basically one blocks are there. So you just focus on the corresponding bits on all the blocks and then take the parity and then construct the bit for the parity block. So a sequence of bits across all the blocks take a parity and then keep that as the corresponding bit in the parity block. Now the idea is if any of these blocks is inaccessible because of the disk failure the parity will tell us whether the missing block the bit is either 0 or 1 because you can recompute that using the parity right. So that is the idea of parity blocks. So compute parity blocks like this and then put all the parity blocks on a redundant disk called the parity disk. So you have a parity disk, data disks, parity disk. The parity disk is the redundant disk actually. So it has some redundant information, but if any of the data disks fails, one failure we can handle. If one disk crashes, then we can actually reconstruct. If the disk K fails, set the ith bit of the block J using the ith parity bit of the block J and repeat this for all the blocks. It has 100 blocks, let us say. For all the 100 blocks, we have parity bits there. Parity blocks are there. Each parity block will have information about bits in the block. Bits in the block. So, set the ith bit of the block J using the ith parity bit of the block J. So, you will be able to reconstruct one block, one disk from all the other disks, information about the other disks. So, this is a very great idea, right? Beautiful idea. So, with even though you have n data disks, with one extra disk, with one extra disk, we get very good performance and reliability. The more important thing is reliability. If the disk fails, we are able to recover the data, we are able to recover the data using the parity. Uh, this. And performance of course comes because we have done the data striping. Performance comes because we have done the data striping, we have put the blocks on several disks. So we can, uh, so if you have a large uh, request say get me, get me 50 consecutive blocks from the file then I can get blocks from all the 5 disks simultaneously and so I will get a 5 fold increase in my uh, performance. Of course, you have to work, I am glossing over several details exactly which block goes to what disk and all that you have to keep track of and then and then read them appropriately. Okay. I am trying to give you some high level uh, idea of how this whole thing works. Okay, is this idea clear of trying to construct? Uh, this, this, the important thing here is that we are calling it something like a parity block. A parity block is bit level parities for all the bits of, of a bunch of blocks. 
that's what is a parity block the bunch of corresponding blocks right zeroth block on disk 1 zeroth block on disk 2 zeroth block on disk 5 consider them for them you construct a zeroth parity block in the parity block will basically have parity bits for each of the bits of that set of blocks okay so if any of those blocks becomes inaccessible because of disk crash we can reconstruct that block and if we can reconstruct one block we can reconstruct any number of blocks using the same parity now consider consider writing a block consider writing a block to such a disk system if you write a block depending on the uh, the striping policy it will go to some disk it will go to some disk right and then you have to since it you are updating the block on that disk the parity information will change so you have to update the parity also so if you if you the each of these blocks that you are writing is some kth block on some disk right so for all the kth block on all the disks there is a parity block so if you write the if you update the kth block then you have to update the parity block without updating the parity block then it will be the parity information will not be correct if you don't update the parity right so each each uh, the read is simple you don't nothing uh, will change nothing will change if you are writing or updating a block updating a block obviously you are changing the bits in the block and so the parity information changes so you have to update the parity block okay now all the parity blocks are on the parity disk so anybody changes anything in the blocks in anywhere in the data blocks they have to go change in the data in the parity block so you can now see that the average number of writes on the parity block will be some a factor of times the average number of writes on the data blocks on the data disks because there is only one parity disk so anywhere you write in any of these 10 disks you have to go and write on the on the parity disk so the average number of writes on the parity disk will actually be very high and if you are you know using a disk a lot than the other disks then obviously the aging will occur and so that might fail and that that is what we should not allow it to fail because that's our redundant information right that is the uh, parity disk so here comes the interesting idea here comes an another interesting idea called distributed parity why should we put all the parity blocks in one disk if you put all the uh, uh, parity blocks in one disk even though we get very good performance and protection against a single disk crash the parity disk usage increases and it in some sense ages faster and so so we consider an idea why don't you distribute the parity information why should we keep it in one disk so each use use each of these disks as a redundant disk for some part of the data use each of these disks as a redundant or parity disk for some part of the the data so that's the idea behind what is called distributed parity so let me see let me give you some more details here yeah? 
say let's say we have disks d0 d1 d2 d5 some six identical disks are there let's say for just for discussion purpose let's say we have 60 cylinders in each of those disks 60 cylinders on each of those disks. Yeah, 60 is actually a ridiculously small number and <laughs> they have thousands of cylinders now use each of each of these disks as a redundant disk for basically one sixth of the data. Now, how do you organize this one sixth? One can actually work out. Okay. So, say cylinder 0, cylinder 6, cylinder 12 of the disk 0 will have parity blocks for the same cylinders on the other disks. Okay. So, the other disk 0, if, if disk 0 is going to be parity, parity, then there are this d1, d2, d5, right? The other five, uh, other uh, five disks are there. So, for the other five disks, you take these cylinders, cylinders 0, 6 and 12 and so on. For those cylinders, for those cylinders, each of those cylinders will have lots of blocks. The cylinders will have lots of blocks. compute parity for all of those blocks. So, instead of computing parity for all the blocks, now we are only considering these cylinders only. For these cylinders alone, you put, uh, put the parity blocks on the disk 0. Okay. So, roughly cylinder, uh, the disk 0 will have Parity information for one sixth of the cylinders, for 10 cylinders it will have uh, information. In a similar way, so you basically need, see, so in, I have not, uh, uh, I have put an etc here, you can imagine. So, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 5, and then 6, 7, 8. So, all the cylinders are being covered here okay, of all the disks d0, d1, and all that. Okay, you, you can also, they are being covered here also. So, you can see that, so now cylinders 1, 7, 13 of D1 will have parity blocks for the cylinders 1, 7, 13 of all the other disks. Okay, so that way what we have done is to kind of distribute the parity information across all the disks instead of keeping it in only one parity disk. Now we are distributing it. So, as long as you keep track of for which of these cylinders, where are the parity blocks? As long as you keep up, keep, keep track of that information, then you are good. Okay. If any disk fails, if a, if a disk fails, say, say D1 fails, then you know. Uh, so, it has lots of cylinders, right. So, for cylinder 0, where are the parity blocks? You know, it is in so and so. Yes. For cylinder something else, 6, etcetera, where are the parity blocks? You can find out. So, like that, you will be able to reconstruct that particular uh, disk. Again, a single disk failure can be handled. So, I am not giving uh, you know um, a formula uh, you know for this, but I think you can kind of work it out as to which cylinder uh, will contain parity for what cylinders. So, the disk usage will be uniform because all the parity information is not in uh, hold up in one particular disk, but it is kind of distributed and so you are protected against. Uh, the uh, wear and tear of that parity disk. Okay, so these are the various, you know, bunch of ideas that are made use of in constructing what is called this RAID levels. RAID is 
redundant array of independent disk techniques. So, there are what are in the industry they are called there are uh, levels that they talk about RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 2, RAID 3, 4 like that they talk about RAID levels. So, the higher the level the better is the performance as well as reliability. So, I will briefly tell you what are the RAID levels standard RAID levels. RAID 0 is uses bit level striping no parity data, no mirroring. So, this is actually no, uh, no nothing, <laughs> it is, it does not have any, uh, so, but it just uh, does bit level striping. So, it gives you very good performance, but it is a risky stuff, risky stuff. RAID 1 uses mirror disks, RAID 1 uses Mirror disk, no parity, no data striping, it just uses mirror disks. So, if you can afford to have lots of storage, then RAID 1 gives good performance and good reliability also. RAID 2 uses bit level striping and redundancy using, uh, uh, you know, instead of parity, they use Hamming codes. And uh, this is actually not much in use currently. Then RAID 3 uses byte level striping, it, it instead of bits, it will stripe bytes, ok, ok. So, it level, it uses byte level um, striping and there is a dedicated parity disk, dedicated parity, that is a single parity disk. This is also not in common use now. RAID 4, 5 and 6 use block level striping. RAID 4, 5, 6 use block level striping. So, RAID 4 is block level striping with dedicated parity disk. RAID 5 is block level striping with distributed parity. So, this is a, a good solution. RAID 6 is much better than RAID, uh, RAID 5. What it does is again uses block level striping, double distributed parity. So, it can uh, actually uh, they use what are called um, Reed Solomon codes for uh, for for this thing. So it can in, ca in fact take care of two disk crashes, almost simultaneous disk crashes. Two disk crashes it can handle. It can tolerate two disk crashes. So RAID six is what is the highest uh, one can go with, with these uh, ideas uh, put together. So I am. Uh, so, I want to give you an idea of, of uh, this is something which is uh, you know very commonly used in um, uh, industry and so the moment you go uh, to any uh, enterprise you start you know uh, have to deal with uh, this rate uh, architectures, you have some idea about what trade architectures are. Okay, so this is one thing but uh, but nowadays actually storage is such a big affair that we have dedicated, dedicated companies that offer storage. So, you would have heard about storage area networks, storage area networks, they are called SANs. So, these are specialized computing systems providing large scale uh, storage with their own dedicated hardware, software, everything uh, you know uh, and it is some it's shared across several servers and it is it is connected through a dedicated high speed network to the uh, to the server using special cables. So, these are called fiber channels. So, to give high speed access to the um, this. So, these are block level uh, data stores, block level data stores. Of course, internally they will use a large number of disks and an appropriate uh, RAID architecture and uh, they offer what is called as CASI uh, interface uh, to the servers. So, I am not going into the details of uh, SANS because this is really, uh, it is a, uh, it is a lot of details in that. So, there are protocols again, you know, 
because it is networks. So, obviously, protocols will come into picture and things like that. So, but anyway, uh, again, the abstraction is again block level. So, block level abstraction, block level access, all that is provided by this. Before um, SANS came into uh, picture, even um, you know, uh, uh, some kind of intermediate systems called network attached uh, storages were tried. You know, the so storage system lying on on the same uh, on the same local area network as the server, but then uh, the local area network bandwidth was uh, you know not sufficient for handling the uh, data transfers. So now you go for a, a dedicated uh, network for storage purpose. Uh, that that is what is storage area networks are all that. Okay. So with these, let me. What time is that? Close this module. So in the next module, I'll be uh, briefly discussing the uh, the various uh, you know algorithms for implementing relational algebra operators. Ultimately, ultimately on the files uh, you store relations data, but then when SQL queries queries are submitted to the system, it has to be it has to be organized as a algebra expression, and then let's see the issues that come there, and then you have to each of those operators uh, will have uh, will have options of as to how they should be executed and so that is again a uh, pretty uh, complex uh, scenario out there. So, we will we will I will give you a brief intro to that uh, subject in the next uh, few lectures ok. Thank you.